Well, as the third theme of the on this uh, structural change, let me illustrate some of the ideas that uh, was discussed in the previous lessons with an application to Finnish agriculture. So I think this will uh, help to clarify also some of the issues in the in the previous lesson. So let me first start to describing the the consolidation of the Finnish agricultural sector and the, which forms the motivation for this study. So remember I mentioned that um, motivation of Oli and Pake's study was the deregulation of the uh, US telecommunications industry, which resulted as a, as a large uh, uh, increase in the number of firms in that, uh, that industry. So there was a lot of entry to, the, to that industry. Uh, in contrast, in the in the Finnish agriculture, the situation has been completely the opposite. And uh, from the policy perspective, of course, it's interesting to note that in 1995, Finland joined the EU, and, and uh, Finnish agriculture became subject to the to the competition with the EU agriculture. And uh, as a result, uh, the number of farms uh, was was declining. It's good to mention that uh, that the number of farms has been declining already for a long time in Finland, but uh, I believe that the EU membership uh, accelerated this uh, this development further, and uh, this has been even despite the the agricultural subsidies paid to the paid to the farmers. So there was uh, approximately hundred thousand farms uh, operating in 1995, and uh, currently there are roughly 50,000 left or perhaps even less than that. But it's also interesting to note that the, despite the, the very sharp decrease in the number of farms in this industry, the total output of the industry, if we, if we measure it in, in, uh, in aggregate monetary term and, uh, and also adjust for the inflation, then in terms of aggregate output, there has been almost no change. There has been some fluctuations but uh, approximately the total output has remained uh, at the same level. So that would suggest that the, the output per farm has been increasing dramatically. If you want to take that as a, some kind of a, a productivity indicator, then certainly output per farm has increased a lot. So then what about the productivity development of this sector? So that comes then uh, to an interesting observation if we compare the uh, agricultural industry level, or in this case we call it sector. Uh, so if you look at this kind of uh, sector level statistics versus uh, farm level studies. So firstly, if you think of the uh, official uh, total factor productivity figures uh, reported by Statistics Finland, uh, the statistical agency that compares the, or they, they report the productivity figures for at the industry level for all industries. And on this slide, I have, I have taken the, the average uh, productivity growth in the period of uh, uh, 2004 to 2013, according to Statistics Finland. So these official numbers indicate very staggering, uh, almost 7% growth per year. So I want you to, Pause for a moment and think about it. it might sound it might sound uh, not so impressive at start, but think about how huge productivity growth it actually is. So, if you, for example, compare to the uh, economic growth of China, so so China has been growing at the rate of uh, let's say seven eight percent uh, per year, and if you think about this huge development in in Chinese economy over the past uh, twenty years or so or thirty years, then uh, these kind of productivity figures for, for of statistics Finland would suggest the enormous growth in the in the Finnish agriculture in terms of productivity. But the situation is very different if we look at the farm level studies. Uh, and uh, here I have just a couple of examples. But uh, usually the farm level studies uh, consider some uh, special um, uh, type of farms, for example, crop farms. Or dairy farms so and this this picture there is then then very different so so productivity growth at the farm level studies is very modest so so uh, there is of course uh, depending on what kind of um, inputs and outputs are considered uh, what kind of uh, methods are considered what kind of time period is considered and so on and so on 
there is a large variance in the results, but typically in, in all examples that I have, I have uh, listed here, uh, the farm level productivity growth has been uh, less than 2% in all of these studies that I considered. So uh, the gap is huge if we have like less than 2% versus almost 7%. So there is like almost a 5% per year gap between the industry level and the, and the farm level. So this was the original motivation for us to, to consider this, that, okay, what could explain this kind of huge gap? And interestingly, also, also similar kind of gap can be observed in other countries. So if you look at, for example, the EU level agriculture, so the, so the EU agriculture has also shown very high productivity growth at the, at the level of the entire sector. But if you look at the farm level studies in different EU countries, you also similarly find relatively modest uh, TFP growth. So now, of course, uh, having already discussed about this uh, uh, structural change, so we claim that uh, that uh, it is the explanation for this large gap relates to the structural change. So you usually common approach in this farm level studies using, for example, the Malmquist index or some index number techniques is to look at the balanced panel of surviving farms. So before start, usually these, uh, these studies, they just uh, uh, leave out all, all those farms that are not observed throughout this time horizon. And uh, as this uh, study of Oli and Pakis already uh, argued, that can lead to some, some bias in the, in the industry level productivity. Uh, further, there can be, of course, reallocation of resources and market share between surviving farms. So this is also not taken into account if we look at only the average productivity of the surviving farms. Um, obviously, as, as this my, my uh, initial in example indicated, that there has been enormous number of exit of farms. So almost half of the farms in, in Finnish agriculture have exit. So have left the, left the sector over the past 20 years. And, and finally, as I mentioned in this example, so farm level studies, typically uh, farm level studies focus on specific farm time, for example, crop farms or, or, um, uh, or dairy farms or, or so on and so on. So, but also, like, like I mentioned in this case of uh, Bernard Redding and Scott, actually farms are, are very... Uh, prime example of uh, multi-product firms. So very often uh, individual farms produces multiple products and there can be also this uh, product switch and, and it, it turns out to be actually uh, quite common and it's actually a specific type of, uh, of uh, structural change in this sector. So there has been particularly uh, a lot of change in Finland from, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, pastoral farms so, so uh, uh, keeping animals and, and moving more towards crop farming. And I will, I will discuss this uh, uh, in a bit more detail shortly. So previously, this kind of structural changes have not really considered at all in agricultural sector. And this is uh, one of the motivations for our study. So only one example, exam, exempt, exception that we could uh, find was the study of Kimuran Sauer, and they, they looked at um, uh, the dairy farming in, in uh, Estonian, Dutch and, uh, and British dairy farming. So they also focus on the specific farm type. And, uh, and, uh, but they, they made an attempt to apply this kind of uh, uh, previous decompositions uh, from the industrial organization literature to agriculture. So Indeed, then, then uh, one of the contributions of our, our study was to make this connection from the agricultural economics literature to this industrial or organization literature that uh, has not been, not been really considered. And uh, because in, in uh, this uh, agricultural data, we did not have this uh, complete census data. So we had only, only rotating samples of farms. So therefore, this kind of uh, existing methods were not uh, directly applicable or not, not in our view as such directly applicable. So this led us to, 
develop this uh, new decomposition that does not re require the share weights but, but uh, relies on these uh, group averages. So in the following, I will then show you the results and, uh, and uh, I will also actually rely on this kind of percentage decomposition. So that's also I see as one advantage compared to this uh, previous attempts to combine the only packets uh, component to the entry and exit. So this is the decomposition that we rely on and, uh, and we apply it uh, next to the Finnish agricultural data. So we have uh, obtained farm level data from the, from the EU, from the FAD and farm accountancy data network. Uh, and uh, so that's important to recognize this, uh, this uh, data source because uh, uh, it is surprisingly difficult to actually have this kind of, uh, kind of um, farm level data. So, so this is not really openly available as, as in many, many other sectors. So we you have to apply it from the, from the EU. However, we have received uh, the data. So, so I want to again mention that it's really an unbalanced uh, panel. So uh, as I mentioned earlier in this case, kind of unbalanced panel data, so we do not observe systematically all of the farms in every year. So typically it's about uh, 900 farms per year that we observe, but not all of the farms are observed in uh, two consecutive years. But this doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, farms have uh, entered or exited the industry. So, so uh, that's why we rely on these kind of group averages to infer these, uh, these uh, components that depend on the, on the market shares indirectly. We do have there also the sampling weights, so, so not each farm is equally likely to be in the sample. So each farm is, is representing a certain number of uh, farms in the actually operating. So we also take into account these sampling weights when calculating those, uh, those uh, group averages. So as the input and output variables, uh, uh, we consider the gross output that has been inflation adjusted using the, the price index. And we consider three inputs, so, so labor, capital and land area. And uh, originally we wanted to make our, our productivity figures uh, comparable to the official TFP uh, figures by Statistics Finland. So we, we wanted to use the Turnquist uh, TFP index, which is the the method of choice by the statistical agencies around the world. Uh, however, we felt really uncomfortable with the with the price data for the for the for these input variables, uh, uh, particularly because for labor input, uh, uh, the farmers' own labor is not really priced in the market. So, so there's not any any wage paid for the for the farmers' own work that we could observe. Um, uh, the opportunity cost of capital is also also notoriously difficult to measure and also we believe that the uh, rental prices for agricultural land uh, are somewhat biased because of the agricultural subsidies so this is why we wanted to then then rely on the shadow prices so our productivity measure could be could be characterized as shadow price turnquist because we first estimated the Cobb Douglas production function with these three inputs. So we wanted to use just a, as conventional method as possible to not draw attention to some kind of estimation issue. Of course, we could do, for example, a CNLS or stones to do that. And, and in the follow-up works, we plan to do that. But in the first paper, we wanted to do as con conventional as possible. So we, we relied on the shadow prices of the Cobb Douglas production function. So we essentially use this output elasticities of the Cobb Douglas production function and use them to form the, the, the uh, cost shares to, to form the Turnquist type uh, total factor productivity index. So I admit that the, the productivity estimation method is somewhat unorthodox, so I'm not aware of this kind of shadow price approach applied to the Turnquist index before. However, that should be fairly consistent with the existing literature and also it, it yields uh, uh, comparable results with the, with the previous literature. So let me go to the, to the results. So this is quite interesting, I believe. So firstly, 
when we look at this survival, so we have uh, divided this um, this uh, study period in two sub periods. So we consider the first ten years of the Finland's EU membership from 1995 to 2004, and then we consider the second decade from 2004 to 2013. There is also one reason because this uh, uh, there was some some change in this uh, this sampling frame in 2004. So these results of the FADN data uh, in, in uh, 2000, uh, before 2004 and after 2004 are not entirely comparable. So that's one reason we also wanted to break down this uh, sample period in two parts to avoid some kind of uh, inconsistency with, the, with this uh, FADN data. So Firstly, if it, I want to illustrate to you the gap between the farm level and industry level. So if you look at the subgroup of uh, surviving farms and survivors now, uh, we definitely specify it as the farms that we observe in 1995 and also in 2004 in this first period. And then those farms that we observe in 2004 and also in 2013. So we do not uh, drop out any kind of uh, kind of temporary uh, absent farms which are not uh, not present in some some of the time periods uh, between those end end period and uh, uh, begin starting period and last period so those are the surviving farms and we also look at the the farms that also maintain the sa same farm type because the farms are indicated that if they are crop farms or dairy farms or some other farm type there is about 10 different farm types. So we also observe if the farm has uh, survived but changed their farm type sometime during the period. And then we also estimate the, the total factor productivity of the sector uh, using this FAD and sample also. So that for that purpose we then first aggregate our inputs and outputs and then estimate the, the, the aggregate productivity growth using data of all farms in the sample. So we see that the aggregate productivity growth of the sector is uh, considerably higher than that of the surviving farms that use the same type. It's not as high as the, as the statistics Finland figure, but it's so much higher than the surviving farms using the same type. So this uh, illustrates that we can replicate this gap that we observe. So like in these usual farm level studies, we focus on the surviving farms that maintain the same type. So for example, crop farms that maintain as a crop farm. Uh, one reason why our aggregate level figures are considerably lower is that uh, we use the gross output rather than value added approach. So we noticed that the value added approach uh, would, uh, would yield systematically higher. So we could also replicate this uh, statistics Finland uh, figures, but, uh, but uh, in our view, the, the gross output approach is, is uh, better. And this also yields more, in our view, more, more meaningful uh, aggregate level productivity growth figures. So we believe that uh, there has been significant growth uh, of total factor productivity at the sector level, but uh, some kind of 7% per year would be, would be ridiculously high. It's, it's, it's not really credible in our view. But anyway, this gap remains, and, and now we want to, want to bridge it. So firstly, let's look at this uh, reallocation effect, uh, that is the Oli and Pakes uh, component. So this is exactly the same as Oli and Pakes would be doing, and this is for the, uh, for the surviving farms. And we find that uh, that, that, was, uh, that was positive in, in both, both time periods, particularly in the second time period. So this would uh, reflect the uh, reallocation of resources such as agricultural land and, uh, and market share to more productive firms. So that is, of course, a positive, positive sign that this is uh, contributing to the productivity growth. Uh, entry and exit effect. Firstly, it's very strong in this first 10 years, uh, uh, but then for, somewhat surprisingly, it turned out uh, negative in this second time period. So uh, in the, in the um, first time period, of course, this entry and exit effect, we, we tend to attribute it mainly to the exit. 
so there has been not really really so much entry to the to the industry so um if you think about this kind of uh, uh generational shift that uh, that uh, typically surviving farms also also if the farm continues it can be that the the farmers change when when uh, when uh, when older farmers retire and uh, and their children take over or grandchildren take over uh, that kind of shift would be would be included in this uh, impact of the surviving farms so we believe that a lot of this kind of generational uh, uh, entry of of younger generation could be contributing to this positive impact of the surviving farms particularly in the in the second period from 2004 to 2013 where there was uh, uh, there was um, um, of course uh, like this uh, baby boom generations uh, started to retire quite quite massively um, when we look in more detail to this negative component of entry and exit effect in the second time period it actually turns out that uh, there was only two specific years in this 2004 to 2013 period that that caused this negative impact and uh, that uh, tended to coincide with the financial crisis so it is possible that uh, some uh, some profitable viable farms also went bankrupt in, during this uh, financial crisis but also it can be also also related to this uh, generational shift that uh, that some of the uh, perhaps some of the highly experienced uh, farmers retired and failed to uh, fail to then uh, then um, uh, transition it to the next generation so sometimes it can be problematic for the for the farmers to to find somebody to continue the operation so uh, we are not fully sure about what causes this negative impact that would call call for further studies was it the financial crisis that killed some uh, some um, profitable farms or or was it this kind of uh, retirement of the baby boom generation and finally the story of the product switch effect is particularly interesting and uh, to somewhat uh, to our surprise uh, it was negative contribution in both time periods so so this product switch was actually uh, lowering down the, the otherwise positive productivity growth and particularly this uh, reallocation of, of uh, land and, uh, and market share to more profitable and more productive farms. And uh, when we investigated this product switch effect in more detail, we actually noticed that there had been a, a quite massive shift uh, of, uh, of um, farms from the, from the animal farming to, to crop farming and uh, when we think about it more carefully there is clearly this uh, particularly this uh, this animal farming has been um, has been consolidating very fast so so that is quite productive uh, sector and it has become more and more productive because the farm sizes have increased and then then small smaller farms have have been either forced out of the sector or they have been forced to switch to the crop farming so it seems to me that this uh, this uh, increased competition in the in the animal farming and this kind of requirement of larger scale production has 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 forced many many smaller farms to to switch to the crop farming but um, this is also in some sense interesting that uh, uh, in Finland the crop farming is not really that uh, that productive uh, industry so if you think about dairy farming or 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 pig farms or 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 growing of chicken so this can be relatively uh, competitive in finland and especially dairy farming where this uh, milk is expiring relatively quickly so so this seems to be a very viable sector in in uh, in finland whereas growing of wheat or, or other crops uh, is much more uh, hurt by the short growing season in finland uh, so in some sense uh, uh, then it's worth to ask what okay why these farms are switching from this kind of more productive sector to less productive sector which is indicated by this our negative impact in the product switch effect and uh, we believe that one reason is in this subsidy policy in agriculture because um, for animals the subsidies are paid per head 
So it, it, it subsidy depends on how many how many cows or how many pigs or how many chicken the farmer has. So that's why the subsidy is much more closely tied to the output of the of the farm. Whereas in crop farming, the subsidy is uh, decoupled from the output. So the subsidy is paid uh, uh, per hectares of land. So that can actually then uh, incentivize uh, uh, sort of inefficient production that you can just uh, just uh, cultivate hectares of land and, uh, and raise subsidy. So, so definitely the crop farming is much more dependent on the subsidies. And it can be that there's... Uh, Farms that fail to compete in the in the in the animal farming then have switched to the to the less productive uh, crop farming where they can rely more on the subsidies, and uh, and uh, our results suggest that there can be a huge uh, decreasing effect on the aggregate level productivity of the of the sector as a result of this kind of the product switch from more productive sector to less productive sector, which is. Uh, uh, very much uh, dependent on the agricultural subsidies. So agricultural subsidies, of course, is a very uh, politically sensitive topic, but, uh, but uh, we hope that our, our results could also, also, uh, also attract more, more critical debate on this, uh, this subsidy, subsidy policies uh, in, in agriculture. So, there are, of course, uh, many ways to possibilities to improve it. So, so as I mentioned, we just re relied on this kind of shadow price uh, Fisher index. Uh, I, I truly believe that this uh, estimation of the of the productivity could be further improved. But uh, in this respect, um, in our study, we also have quoted this uh, uh, phrase by Melit and Polanek, who also also said say that the, the focus of this kind of study is more in the decomposition and uh, addressing the numerous measurement issues of, of firm productivity, that would only lead to somewhat different starting point for the decomposition, but would, uh, would not really uh, change the contrast between these uh, components. So, so I certainly believe that there is much further research needed. Uh, for example, there's um, linking to this uh, uh, structural change decompositions to the question of consistent aggregation of firm level to industry level. And also, of course, uh, uh, these numerous measurement issues in the productivity need to be, need to be uh, addressed. So, so far, there has been very little uh, attempt to try to utilize the best uh, frontier estimation techniques to, to, fully, to full capacity in the, in the productivity uh, measurement. So, I believe that there can be significant progress made in that respect. And finally, when, when considering these new directions, uh, it is quite surprising to observe that uh, while these kind of Malkmus type, type uh, decompositions became popular in the mid 90s, and about the same time also the structural change became uh, uh, introduced into the literature, but these, these two types of decompositions have lived like completely separate life. I haven't really seen any paper that tries to reconcile or, or combine these uh, two types of decompositions. Uh, one reason is, of course, that these Malmquist type decompositions are done at the firm level, where a structural change is the phenomenon at the industry level or more aggregate level. But still, it, it should be very interesting to, to combine these two, two streams of literature. It's not self-evident how to do it, but, but I'm, I'm sure that it is possible. It shouldn't be extremely difficult. And here I, I want to complete with uh, some of the interesting uh, research questions that uh, could be asked with this kind of combination of approaches. So, for example, it might be interesting from the methodological point of view to compare that uh, does this kind of Oli and Pakes type reallocation effect uh, have any correlation with the allocative efficiency component of the Mountquist index or the scale efficiency component or the price effect components of the Fisher index. So. Obviously, this kind of uh, uh, reallocation is very, very interesting, but this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, combination of these different approaches has not been really done, to my knowledge, any, anywhere. And that doesn't even require, strictly speaking, any kind of methodological innovation. It could be possible to just apply the, the Olipikes approach and the Fisher index approach and see if this kind of uh, alternative uh, 
alternative approaches to reallocation uh, do they do they confirm or is there some kind of contrast then if you would go into a little bit more more detail of this um, for example technical progress it would be very fascinating to see that uh, to what is the contribution of the uh, new entrance to the industry to technical progress can they operate immediately at the at the frontier of the of the industry or or do they do they first have immediately some kind of catch up to do and how quickly could for example the new entrants catch up the frontier if they are not there already and and to what extent then this kind of entry of new firms can help to push the frontier further so to shift the technical frontier that's that would be a very very fascinating uh, uh, question but that would require somehow combining insights from two very different parts of the literature and then of course in some sense if we would move a little bit more towards the predictive analytics type of questions then it would be fascinating to see that how the history of the firm's uh, technical efficiency or scale efficiency progress so so can this kind of uh, uh, efficiency change particularly predict the survival probability of firm or its exit probability so if the firm is uh, is uh, lagging behind the frontier then does it uh, does it uh, predict the exit probability there are some kind of uh, studies that consider the the for example uh, dea efficiency as a predictor of the of the of a bankruptcy but uh, to my knowledge this kind of uh, uh, combination of this kind of uh, uh, frontier estimation techniques and, and technical efficiency um, and, and a change of technical efficiency to the to this kind of structural change literature that that could open up like a really fascinating uh, new avenues of research so that that completes my my series of uh, video lectures uh, so i hope that you have enjoyed and and uh, learned something from this uh, from these lessons and uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to seeing your term papers. Bye.